We're going to be looking at Psalm 120 through 123. So let's begin reading together here in Psalm 120. I'll read the, the psalm, and we'll get into our study. Psalm 120, beginning at verse 1. The psalmist writes, In my distress I cried to the Lord, and he heard me. Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue, sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree? Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. Sounds like he was married. Um, Oh, I'm just kidding. I am just kidding. Don't get so mean. Don't turn on me. I've got a few more psalms to go through here. <laughs> Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. And so as we begin looking at these psalms here, we need to note, and if you take notes, you might want to note this, Psalms 120 to 134 begin a series of psalms that are referred to as psalms of ascent, ascent, A-S-C-E-N-T, psalms of ascent, uh, Psalm 120 through 134. These 15 psalms were uh, what we might refer to today as traveling songs. Uh, it's been stated that it is possible that these psalms would have been sung when the Jews returned from captivity in Babylon, but most certainly they were sung when the pilgrims would come to Jerusalem in order that they might celebrate the mandatory feast, feast days. You see, the Bible teaches uh, the Jews, every Jewish male is uh, to be uh, appearing in Jerusalem to worship at certain times. If you take notes, Deuteronomy chapter 16, verse 16 says, three times a year all your males shall appear before the Lord your God in the place which he chooses, at the Feast of Unleavened Bread, at the Feast of Weeks and at the Feast of Tabernacles, and they shall not appear before the Lord empty-handed. And so these psalms, the Song of Ascents, were songs that they would sing as they made their way into the city of Jerusalem to celebrate those festivals. They're called Psalms of Ascents. They're also Psalms of Degrees. And there's a reason why they're referred to that way, because each day as they were traveling to the city of Jerusalem, they would sing a psalm. And the final psalm that they would sing, which is Psalm 134, would be sung as they were standing there by the temple. Now, the point of the psalms of ascents or songs of ascents or songs of degrees, the simple point is that life is an ascent. We slowly, in other words, as we're coming to God, we are moving from a place where we at one time were living, which would be a place of of, of sin. In this particular way here, it speaks of being in distress and in captivity, but, but the picture spiritually would be moving from that place of captivity. And the Bible teaches us that when we're in sin, we are also in bondage. Jesus made it very clear that an individual who is habitually in sin is also a person who's in slavery, slavery to that sin. And so when the Word of God came to you and through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, your eyes were opened you began to have an ascent yourself. You began to move from that place in bondage to the freedom of worship in the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and so we know that our, our life in Christ is a, a steady, constant moving up in life. That's why the apostle Peter in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18 would say, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Grow. Life is an ascent. It's moving from bondage to sin, to freedom in Christ. And that's what you actually see here in the Psalms from Psalm 120 all the way to Psalm 134. You see him rising in degrees in his movement, and you'll see that clearly as we get into this study in just a moment. So as you begin here in verse 1, notice how he says, in my distress I cried to the Lord and he heard me. Now, it would seem that this psalm originally was written by somebody in captivity. As a matter of fact, we even know where that would have taken place. It's told to us in verse 5. He says, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. So it's obviously an individual who's in captivity. Now, when he speaks of Meshech and Kedar, you need to understand that in Genesis, all the way in the first book of the Bible, Genesis chapter 10, verse 2, that we see that, uh, that Meshech, 
uh, was actually Japheth, Japheth's son. And uh, when, you, when you look at the sons of, uh, of Noah, you had Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And I'm not going to go in a long teaching with you about that. You can see that in the early chapters of Genesis. But he had three sons, and the three sons actually represent the peoples uh, that have descended from, from Noah through those three, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so Japheth had a son named Meshech. That represents to us the Gentile nations. Now, Kedar... When you see he's in captivity in Kedar, Kedar is one who was a descendant of Ishmael. Ishmael representing the uh, Arabs and all. And so what he's speaking about here is being in captivity. And, and it's a picture of how the Jews even prophetically have been spread throughout the world and in captivity and all. And that's what he's talking about because this is a picture of a Jewish person in exile. They're living uh, away from their home and they're now living among Gentiles and, and Arabs. And it does represent Israel after the flesh so, sojourning among those who despise them. Uh, it was taking place at that time even as it even to this day continues. And so what we have here is someone who's saying, I'm in distress and I'm crying out to the Lord. And what is a blessing for us to see is in his distress and in his crying to the Lord, notice what he says in verse 1, he heard me. And so for us as believers, it's a very important thing to realize that when you cry out to God, you can also say, I cried out to the Lord in my distress and I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he listens to me as I do so. And so he cries out in verse 2, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. What shall be given to you, or what shall be done to you, you false tongue, sharp arrows of the warrior with coals of the broom tree? And so he's saying, as I'm in exile, I'm being maligned. As I'm in exile, my captors are lying about me constantly. And the words are piercing. They're piercing me even like arrows can pierce my flesh. Now, the Bible tells us in Proverbs 25, 18, a man who bears false witness against his neighbor is like a club, a sword, and a sharp arrow. Psalm 57, verse 4, my soul is among lions. I lie among the sons of men who are set on fire, whose teeth are spears and arrows, their tongue a sharp sword. So he's saying, I'm being maligned, and the words are piercing me. They're piercing me. I'm being maligned by people who hate God. And as a righteous soul, it destroys me to be lied about by those who are doing so. You know, when, when, you're, when you're among those who despise you, the words that they have to say about you often can inflict great pain. And, and that's just part of being a believer. Uh, just this week, just this week, um, on, when was it? On Monday, um, I, I had to deal... With, with, with something like that in my, in my own life. There was somebody who, who, who said some incredibly uh, vicious and untrue things uh, about, about me. And you want to know something? It's, a, it's a unfortunate, but, but that's, just the, that's just what happens. I mean, you can't take everything to heart, but, but sometimes when people say things about you, they can pierce you, and it can be, it can be hurtful. But, but you can't help but think of what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, in verse 11, Jesus said, Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. You're blessed by that. As a matter of fact, in another place, he says, uh, Woe unto you when all men speak well of you. You know, so the bottom line is, let's face it, is, uh, is there are people who malign you? And that's what he's saying here. Now, notice, notice he's saying in verses 3 and 4, well, what, would you, what should we do? Uh, what should be returned unto them? What they're doing to me should be done back is the point he's making here. If you take notes, uh, Proverbs 26, 27, this is a good scripture. He who digs a pit will fall into it, and he who rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. You know, you ultimately reap what you sow. That's why we ought to be very careful how we speak about other people. You ultimately reap what you sow. He goes on and says in verses 5 through 7, Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. I'm dwelling amongst those who despise the Lord. I'm among those who love strife and hate peace, and I simply just don't fit in. One of the things that I've discovered is believers, listen, the closer you get to the Lord, the less you, for, you fit in. 
The closer you get to the Lord, and the more your life begins to change because of that, the less you fit in. That's just the way it is. So many times we want, we want to actually fit in. We, we don't want to be too different. But the fact is, is a light shines very brightly in a dark place. And when God begins to work in your life, you're not going to fit in. And, and that's just the way it is. He's saying basically this. He's saying, you know what? I'm just simply homesick. You know, as I'm growing older in the Lord, I'm not getting tired of life. I enjoy life. As a matter of fact, my life is blessed more and more all the time, and I'm just so grateful for what God does in it. You know, I enjoy my life an awful lot. But at the same time, as I'm growing older, I'm discovering that this world really doesn't have much to offer me. As a matter of fact, there's less and less. And as I, I'm also discovering something uh, that I've, I've believed for a long time, but it's becoming even more and more personal in my life. You know, I'm just passing through. The earth is not my home. You know, heaven is my home. And I'm looking forward to spending my time there. The Bible tells us in 1 Peter 2, 11, Beloved, I beg you as sojourners. A sojourner is a temporary resident. He has no citizenship. As sojourners and pilgrims, a pilgrim is a foreigner, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. You are a temporary resident resident. You are foreign. You're living there. You're among them, but you are not of them. You're there in the world, but you're not of the world. So keep that in mind, and don't get so hung up on the things of the world that they weigh you down, is the point he's making here. And for us, let's face it, you know, we're just passing through. And there are times that you can say, just what, he, what are you saying here? Woe is me, I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell among the tents of Kedar. My soul has dwelt too long with one who hates peace. I am for peace when I speak, therefore war. I am not fitting in. I'm ready to move on to the place that God has called me, and I want to be there. So this is the opening psalm of the Psalm of Ascent. It speaks to us concerning moving on in life and ascending to be closer to the Lord. You move on into verse 21, and he continues by saying, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. From whence comes my help? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. He will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. The Lord is your keeper. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day nor the moon by night. The Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. And so moving on as he's beginning to share here in Psalm 121, we know that the first psalm we looked at described what it's like to live as a stranger in a hostile environment. And uh, it could even be a picture, if you will, if you want to spiritualize it in that way. It could be a picture of somebody who was recently saved and they're moving now towards maturity. So now he has left that environment and he's moving closer to the Lord. He's making his way to Jerusalem. And as he does so, he's beginning to look around. And, and when you go to Jerusalem and you're coming uh, towards it, it's always ascending. And, and as you're going to Jerusalem, it's a picture as he's looking at the hills there, he can have two emotions. He can have anxiety and he can have anticipation. Now, anxiety, because he's moving in, and there in the hill country, there could be vagabonds. There could be people there who are, who are going to come out of the hills and, 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 and rob him. And, and also, he can look there with a certain kind of anxiety, but there's also a sense of anticipation, because the hills are hiding the city of Jerusalem from his sight. And he knows that just behind those hills, there's the most beautiful city in the world, and he's looking forward to seeing it. And as he's thinking about this, from whence cometh my help, he goes on to think, my help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. As he's thinking about it, he realizes the Lord is the one who gives him his help. That's what the Bible says in Psalm 511, let those who rejoice, uh, let all those rejoice who put their trust in you. Psalm 20, verse 7, when he speaks of my help comes from the Lord, some trust in chariots, some in horses, we will remember the name of the Lord our God. And so as he's thinking about this, and his life can be filled with anxiety, it is also filled with anticipation. It gives to us a, a question, why would I trust in the Lord? Well, he says in verse 3, he will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. When I am concerned, this is important, and let's see if we can, if we can make this practical. I'm talking to believers now. One of the things that I like about the Psalms is they're real. There are real emotions that are, are given to us, you know. Sometimes we think of, of ancient writers and their inspiration that God gave to them, and we may think that they're beyond 
the regular emotions of other human beings. We may think of them as being almost insulated from that, but they're not. They weren't insulated from it. They're human beings that were, were faithfully following God who experienced the same kinds of things that you do and that I do. And, and he's saying, I'm looking at the hills and I have, I have anxiety. I'm looking at the hills because in those hills there could be robbers. In those hill, hills there could be dangers and all. And as I look at them, I have a concern. But at the same time, I have also a, an anticipation because I'm drawing closer to the city of Jerusalem. And, and, and I want to make it there because I, I want to go into the gates of that city and I want to go and worship the Lord. I've been there many times and I'm, and I'm looking forward to doing it again, he's saying. And, and then he begins to think, where's my help going to come from? And then it hits him again once again. Again, my help comes from the Lord. He's the creator of all things. He will take care of me. And that's what he means when he says, you will not allow your foot to be moved. He who keeps you will not slumber. That word moved there, when he says to be moved, it speaks of actually losing your balance or stumbling. It could be a word that you use, tottering and all. He doesn't allow you to lose your balance. He's not going to let you slip. I was sharing this just last Sunday night, you know, with all the rain I, in uh, my, my backyard, I have some hills there, and, and the mud came pouring down into the sidewalk, and so I was there on Saturday, and, and uh, I got a hose, and I was going to wash down the sidewalk, and as I'm washing down the sidewalk, I'm wearing my, my, um, my sandals, and, and they have rubber soles, and, and, you know, wet rubber soles on mud, and, and so as I stepped on it with the hose, I stepped on the mud accidentally. I started sliding all over the place. And, you know, when you're my age, you're not as limber as you used to be. And your body begins to scream and say things to you like, don't hit the ground because I'll break, you know. And I'm thinking, ooh, like that. And I was sliding all over, and I'm holding this, this I'm holding the, the hose in my hand, and for some reason I don't want to let go of this stupid thing, so I'm going like that. And my two boys are standing at the door watching Dad, and, 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 and I know I'm going to hit, I, and, I, and I know I'm going down, and there's just no way I'm going to stay up. So the thing I'm trying to think of uh, is what can I keep clean because I'm going to land in the mud, and I don't feel like going into change. And that's what I'm thinking, so what, where am I going to hit? And really slow motion, kind of like one of those, when you see these movies of these, these buildings that are demolished, and they show you in slow motion how the thing falls. Well, that's what I'm doing, really slow. And, 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 and I hit. And as I hit, I hit on my left elbow. And I'm still pushing myself up, holding onto the hose for some reason. And I, and I finally get all this mud all over my side. But my jeans didn't get dirty, and I was feeling good. But my son David is standing there looking at me. And my son David is, is horrible because he's just like me. He thinks those things are rather funny. And I, I, and I <laughs> but I'm not. So I look at him as I'm laying in the mud, holding on to this. You know, I'm muddy here, and I'm looking at him. And he's saying, hey, Dad, you look like you're dancing on ice. And I said, you know, I'm really not in the mood, son. This is not the moment for you to speak to your father. As a matter of fact, because if you want to live a little bit longer, you better shut up. You know, this is not a wise thing to do. So as I was reading this, I thought of that. He shall not allow your fit, foot, to, uh, try that again, foot to be moved. And I'm saying, is that right? Then what happened to me on Saturday? Obviously, this has got some spiritual thing here that he's talking about. And it is. You see, Psalm 94, verse 18 says this. If I say my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. I like that. If I say, my foot slips, your mercy, O Lord, will hold me up. You see, the Bible tells us in the New Testament book of Jude, verses 24 and 25, Jude 24 and 25, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. God will keep you from stumbling, not simply just keep you from ever falling down, but spiritually, He holds you up. And for me, that is a very important reality in my spiritual life. God keeps me and holds me and protects me. He lifts me up. He keeps me from stumbling in those areas that can bring me down. When He says, you will not allow your foot to be moved, he who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel shall neither slumber nor sleep. We need to know that the pagans, many of the pagans that uh, worship false gods that surrounded Israel, many of those pagans had gods. Check this out. This blows my mind, but it's true. They had gods that needed to go to sleep. So their gods went to sleep. At night, they'd be asleep. That left these people on their own. 
but our God never slumbers nor sleeps. That's the point he's making. He who keeps Israel, he who guards Israel, whose eye is on the nation, is alert 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You can call at him, call out to him at any time. That's the point that he's making. Your God is alive. When he says in verse 5, the Lord is our keeper, that's our guardian. The Lord is your shade at your right hand. The sun shall not strike you by day, nor the moon by night. Uh, the bottom line is the sun and the moon represent times of danger. You can have sunstroke because it's so hot, or nighttime, that's you're, you're, you're susceptible to attacks from the, those who are hiding in the dark. So the obvious picture is that God is there constantly on guard watching you day, on, day and night, even when you're not aware of it. The Lord's eye is on you constantly, even when you're not aware of it. Even as a father like me, when my children were very small and they would be playing anywhere, I would be speaking to somebody, but my eye would be on my child. Because especially when they were small, I knew that it just takes a moment for them and they can get hurt. Every parent knows that. You learn that because one time you may have taken your eye off of them, and when you did so, something happened. And so as a dad, that's what I would do, and I still do that as a grandfather. When my Josiah is near me, anywhere near me, my eye is constantly on him because I do the very best I as a human being can do to make sure he doesn't get hurt. I watch my grandson like a hawk. I keep my eye on him. Not only do I do that, but I tell his mother to do that. I tell Marie, let's make sure we keep our eye on him. If my son David's in the room, I say, watch him for a moment. I have to step out. If it's Joseph, I do the same thing. Watch him. I have to step out because your eye is constantly on him. Now, if I, as, a, as an evil father, an evil grandfather, have an eye on a child I love, how much more so does God have his eyes on me? And God's eye is on you. And he watches you, and that's what the psalmist is saying. He's saying, we don't have some God that you actually put a little blanket over at night so he can go mimi. He's saying, we have, we have a God that, that watches over us 24 hours a day. And he watches us when it's daytime. He watches us at the nighttime. God cares for you. In verse 7, the Lord shall preserve you from all evil. He shall preserve your soul. The Lord shall preserve your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. God's care is on you every day. God's care continues into eternity. His loving eye is on you at all times. He guards you and he protects you even when you are least aware of it. The Lord's eye is upon you. And that's an absolutely beautiful truth. He keeps you and watches over you and protects you and moves you out of danger. I was driving on the freeway. Not recently. It's been a while now. I'm driving on the freeway. Marie and I are going up into Glendale. It's about 7.30 at night. Normally when you have a four-lane highway, I have a tendency of driving to in the lane that's closest to the fast lane, not the fast lane, but the third lane, and, and that's where I normally drive. I had pulled into the fast lane. When I pulled into the fast lane, there's no traffic. I begin to think, I don't really feel comfortable here, but there's no traffic, and for some reason, as I'm thinking that, I'm thinking, you know, I don't feel comfortable here. I just uh, turned, you know, I changed lanes all the way to the slow lane. I never travel in the slow lane because that's an irritating lane to travel in. Not because the traffic's so slow, but because people getting on the freeway scare me because sometimes they stop, you know, just before they get on or they'll just pull in front of you and all. So I usually stay as far away from those entrance lanes as I can. But there was no traffic in front of me, and I start pulling over. So I'm in the third now, in the second, I'm there in the, in the slow lane and all. And as I moved into the slow lane, on my left side, there's a chain link fence, and through that chain link fence comes an 18-foot stake bed truck come in the opposite direction. He blew through that fence, came into the fast lane, in the lane that I would have been in had I remained there. But for some reason, without me thinking about it, I have an inclination to change lanes all the way to the slow lane, and he comes blowing past us in the fast lane. And I turned to Marie, and I said, that was the Lord. That was the Lord. He said for me to move over. I didn't hear his voice audibly. He didn't say, son, get into the slow lane. But there was this sense, get into the other lane. And you know what I'm talking about because he's done that for you too. 
where you have had this sense, I need to go here or do this, and then the Lord meets you in a special way there or protects you in a special way. The Lord does that. And so we know this by experience. The Lord preserves you from all evil. He preserves your soul. He preserves your going out and your coming in from this time forth and even, he says, forevermore. The Lord is good to us and takes care of us in every way, shape, and form. Psalm 122, continuing, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord, for thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you because of the house of the Lord, our God. I will seek your good. And so as he's speaking here, he's remembering what a joy it is to go to the city of Jerusalem. And just thinking about that, it causes his heart to just rejoice. I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. I am so blessed, he's saying. The thought as I'm coming to uh, Jerusalem in this pilgrimage, just the anticipation of entering into the city. I've been there before, and it's such an exciting thing. I can still remember uh, our very first journey into the city of Jerusalem. I believe it was back in 1983. And I remember as we went to Israel, you know, I hadn't been uh, overseas uh, for some time, and, and my wife Marie and I and my daughter Anna, who was three months old at the time, went uh, with several pastors in a Get Acquainted to, with Israel tour and all. And, and I remember going there, and, and I remember arriving there in Tel Aviv, and, and as our, our plane landed, and, and you get off the plane, you know, and you go and claim your luggage, and you do all the things that you need to do going through customs and all. And then we, uh, we finally exit, and you, and you go into the bus, and we're all seated there. And we've been traveling for some time, and we're all seated there. And, and then our guide uh, climbs into the bus there, and he picks up this microphone, and he's standing in the front, and he looks at us. And it's our, my very first time in Israel, and as I'm sitting there with Marie, and we're kind of like, you know, we've been traveling for a while, and our bodies are kind of tired and all. I still remember his first words when he said to us, welcome home. And when he said, welcome home, something inside of me left with recognition, and it hit me. You know, I have been studying this, this, this land. I have been studying this nation uh, since I got saved in 1970, and I've, I've been teaching about this nation and, and the ways of God that are derived from his from his, uh, his Bible here about the nation of Israel since 1973. And so for 10 years, I've been studying the Gospels and the Old Testament and teaching and all, and now I'm in the place that I have, I've only seen on the page or a picture in somebody's book. Now I'm here in Tel Aviv, and I have to tell you, there was an incredible experience. For those of you who are going to be going with us at the, uh, at the end of March, I am, I'm starting to get so pumped up because I see this, and I'm thinking about this even as I was teach, as I'm teaching it when I was reading this, and it says, I was glad when they said to me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. I was remembering that. I was remembering as, as we were driving from the north up in the Galilee region, we came south and started ascending into, into Jerusalem. And for me, uh, it was just a, a phenomenal experience. I still remember being seated in the, in the bus, and, and we were coming around this corner, and a friend of mine, Wayne Taylor from, from Seattle Fellowship up there in, in, in Washington, Wayne turns to me and he says, listen, he says, uh, when we come around this bend here, you're going to see Jerusalem. It's going to explode in front of you because he'd been there before. And so Marie and I are, are seated there in, in our little, um, in the bus, you know, in our, our chair, and we came around the corner, and then you see the Dome of the Rock, which glistens in the sun. And you see that area there, and the city exploded on us. And I have to tell you, that my heart was just like, man, I had never felt such an incredible spiritual rush as I did that day. And now I look forward to, I, I understand what this pilgrim is saying. I look forward to going back 
to walk in those streets, to be in there in the Sea of Galilee and all the places that we have visited so many times now. And I look forward to that so much. It's such a joy. And so that's what he's speaking about. Our feet have been standing within your gates, O Jerusalem. We know the feeling of that. And then he describes Jerusalem. Verse 3, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. For thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. So it's a picture of him there as he's entering into the city, and it's like he's admiring the city. And as he's admiring the city, you can see that it's thronging with the pilgrims, and they're compacted there in this city, in the streets. And the various tribes are there. And this is an interesting picture. You need to see this. I want you to see how he says about what he says in verse 4, where the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, to the testimony of Israel, to give thanks to the name of the Lord. What are you saying, psalmist? What I'm saying is this. What a blessing it is to go spiritually home to a place where I can worship God, where there is unity of spirit amongst all those who love Him. You have 12 tribes of Israel, but we make up one nation, he would be saying. Though you have the tribe of Reuben and the tribe of Gad and the tribe of Issachar, and, and you can name the 12 tribes, you have all of these tribes, yet we have one nation. And, and because we have one nation, we also have one purpose, and that one purpose is to worship God together. And what you have here is a picture of the unity that we have, and it's a picture of the unity of all believers. One of the saddest things that we, that we encounter and sometimes might even be part of without even acknowledging or being aware of is, is um, sometimes if people don't necessarily associate with the name of our particular expression of our Christian faith, if somebody doesn't call themselves a Calvary Chapel and perhaps they're from a First Baptist Church or, or whatever, we may not feel a kinship with them. But I've discovered something. We are one in the Lord Jesus Christ, and that's the most important thing. That's the most important thing, isn't it? To have a unity of the Spirit. You know, somebody may want to worship the Lord in a different way. Perhaps their order of service is different. But if they worship the true and living Jesus Christ, then together we have unity. That's the picture. The Bible tells us in Colossians 3.15, Let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you were called in one body. Be thankful. One body. You know, you have hands and feet. We're going through uh, 1 Corinthians. We're going to be coming to chapter 12 pretty soon. And and that's one of my favorite chapters in 1 Corinthians because he takes a great amount of time to express the unity of the body, that we all belong together because we have one head, and that is Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Savior. And it's really a wonderful, wonderful experience. And so we need to have unity. We need to have unity with one another. That's a picture of unity. It's also a recognition of how, how there is, a, if you will, a governmental or political reality because in verse 5 he says, thrones are set there for judgment, the thrones of the house of David. So Jerusalem is a religious center, but it is also the political center, and he rejoices. He says in verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. We have actually had Jewish people saying that to us when we tour there. They will say that to you. They will say, please pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Please pray for us. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within your walls, prosperity within your palaces. For the sake of my brethren and companions, I will now say, peace be within you. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek your good. Now, one day, Jerusalem will once again be the center of worship the way it's intended to be. At this moment, obviously, Jerusalem really does need a lot of prayer for peace. I mean, the Jewish people, even though they by right uh, do possess the city of Jerusalem, still they have yielded over great portions of it and significant areas of it to, uh, to, the, uh, to the Muslims and all. And so you, when you go there, uh, may not even be allowed to go up into the... Um, up by the western gate, the western wall, rather, uh, up into the, the temple mount there because they're not allowing Americans up there and all. Though a friend of mine, Pancho, was there last year. He's there right now, as a matter of fact. And he and his wife and kids were walking, and, and uh, there are guards now, and there have always been as long as I know, up there. And he started to walk up, and as they started to walk up, he could hear the guards saying, um, you know, uh, 
uh, we can't let you in, you're Americans. And he was, they were speaking to some people in front, so Pancho and Millie began to speak Spanish, and they got past them and went on up, you know? <laughs> But, you know, right now they cannot fully possess the city. They can't build their temple at the moment. Interestingly enough, and you might find this interesting, I do, Hosea chapter 3, verses 4 and 5 in the Old Testament. Uh, Hosea says, For the, uh, the children of Israel will live for many days without king or prince, without sacrifice or sacred pillar, without a fod or household idol, Afterwards, the children of Israel will return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. They will come trembling to the Lord and to his blessings in the last days. So there is a period of time that was prophesied in Hosea 3, verses 4 and 5, that they would go for many years without the ability to go into the temple and to worship. There would be no ephod. The ephod represents the priesthood. But ultimately, under the reign of Jesus Christ, they will once again rejoice in the city of Jerusalem. And so that's a picture prophetically that will be fulfilled when Jesus comes and rules and reigns. As he continues the Psalms of Ascent, we get to Psalm 123, and he says, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of a maid to the hand of her mistress. So our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. Have mercy on us, O Lord, have mercy on us, for we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. So he's saying in verses 1 and 2 uh, that, that he's lifting up his eyes to the Lord. So this psalm has been called the eye of hope. Because this is a picture that the temple has now come into his view. He can now see the temple as he's going through the Psalms of Ascent. And so the temple has come into view. And though I'm looking at the temple, he's saying, I'm aware that you are not limited to that temple. You need to see that in verse 1 because it says, Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. In other words, and this is an important point, because during the time of the writing of the Psalms, so many pagans had what you called territorial gods. Their god was the god of the land that they lived in. When they went to war with another people who had other gods, they would actually take their gods and say that their gods were at war with the other gods, and if they won, then their god was now over the gods of that land. And that's how it is, and you see that in the Old Testament all the time. But they were limited to certain geographic locations. Israel knows that their God is not simply a tribal God limited to certain area. That's what he's saying here in verse 1. He says, you dwell in the heavens. In other words, the God that I worship is not a tribal God. It's not some national deity. Christianity isn't a Western belief system, though we hear that all the time. Well, it's a Western belief system. No, it's a world belief system. Jesus Christ said, take this gospel throughout the whole world and make disciples. He didn't say it should be restricted to the land of Israel. That's why we here in the United States, 2,000 years after Jesus sent his disciples out, are speaking about Jesus Christ, who was a Jewish man from the Middle East. Because he said, take this message out. In the Old Testament, three times a year, the, the, the males were required, 13 years and above, to come and worship in Jerusalem if they had the ability to do so. They had to come into Jerusalem because the temple of God was in Jerusalem, and that's where God said he would meet with the people. But Israel knew that God was not limited to that place because the apostle Paul on one occasion in Acts chapter 17, verse 24, said this. He said, God who made the world and everything in it, he's the Lord of heaven and earth. He doesn't dwell in temples with hand, made with hands. He said, God isn't one of these little tribal gods that you control by placing him in a box. He owns everything. He, he, has, he has said, I will meet with you there, but he's not limited to that, you see. And so when Jesus Christ died on the cross, you know as well as I that the temple, there was a veil that was within the temple separating the holy place from the holiest of holies, and it was torn from the top down indicating that Lord, the Lord God was making entrance into the holy place, the holiest of holies, possible now through the blood of Jesus Christ. He's not limited to the city of Jerusalem. He's not limited to a temple. 
He's the God of the universe. And even here, it's pointing that out. Unto you I lift up my eyes, O you who dwell in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look to the hand of their masters, as the eyes of the maid to the hand of her mistress, so our eyes look to the Lord our God until he has mercy on us. I'm dependent on you, and I'm careful to keep my eyes on you, even as a servant is there watching closely in the event that somebody needs some help. You know, you might find this interesting. Some of you probably did the same kinds of things when you were growing up. But as, as bad a little boy as I could be, there was one thing I did have, and I did have a lot of love for my dad. And when I was a little guy, I actually would watch my dad to see if he needed anything. Was there anything that he needs? And my dad would be doing something, and my dad would turn and look at me and say, David, you need to go get me a hammer, or David, go get me the crescent. He called it the crescent wrench, an adjustable wrench. David, go and get me this. And I'd run and get it and bring it back for him because like a son looking to the father for direction, that's what I would do. Well, you know what? As a Christian man, I want to be like this. I want to keep my eyes on the Lord so if he says, I need you to do this, I'm ready to go whenever he says. That's the picture that we have here. As a servant looks to his master, as, as a young lady maidservant looks to her mistress, even so I look to you. And whatever you need me to do, Father, that's what I want to do. Why? Because I'm your servant. Because I want to serve you. What do you want me to do? Whatever it is, I'll do it for you. And that's the point. I'm dependent on you, and I keep my eyes on you. Have mercy on us, O Lord. Have mercy on us. For we are exceedingly filled with contempt. Our soul is exceedingly filled with the scorn of those who are at ease, with the contempt of the proud. Well, Lord, we have come from a place where hatred towards us is normal in our way of life. And we know that without your mercy, we wouldn't survive. We've been held in scorn by others. And because we have been held in scorn by others, I'm asking you not to hold me in scorn. I'm asking you to receive me. So I'm asking you for your mercy. I know what it's like to feel and to be rejected, he's saying. I know what it's like to be spoken evil of and to be torn up maliciously by men's and women's words, by gossip that tears through the soul. I know what that's like. So what I'm asking you to do is show me mercy, Lord. Don't be like man. Don't reject me. Don't be like man. So I'm asking you in your mercy to receive me. Now, I'm aware of the fact that I am a sinner. And I know that sin makes a separation between me and you. I know that that's an issue that needs to be resolved. So I'm asking you in your mercy to resolve that issue. You could even go so far as to say, I want to take you at your word, even as you said in Isaiah in chapter 1, verse 18. Because in the Old Testament book of Isaiah, in chapter 1, verse 18, God gives an invitation. He says, Come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. That's the only place in Scripture that you ever see the Lord saying, Let's reason together. And what he wants to reason together is not to give to you uh, an opportunity to argue with him and explain to him why your plan of salvation is much better than his. But he wants you to reason with him relating to your sins. And he's saying, listen, I've got a proposition to make to you, and I want you to hear this very clearly. I want you to know that you are in sin, but I can make you clean. I want you to know that. So as we discuss this amongst ourselves, let me say this to you, he would be saying, I am capable of washing you clean. So the psalmist is just remembering those kinds of sentiments, if you will, by saying to him, show me mercy. Lord, I know what it's like to be rejected. I know what it's like to have people say evil things concerning me. I know what it's like to be in bondage. I know what it's like to, to, to have no hope or anything. But when I turned my eyes to you and my heart was touched by you and you, 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 you drew me to yourself, Lord, you showed me what grace is and I'm asking you to refresh me through your mercy because I don't want to be rejected by the only one in the universe that really matters. You see, it's one thing for some guy or some girl or some you know, boss or even your parents, or grandparents or brother and sister to reject you. That's one thing, but you can live with that. But when you're rejected by the Lord, that's the ultimate rejection. That's the ultimate rejection. I don't want to be rejected by the Lord. I want to be received by the Lord. In order to be received by the Lord, I need the mercy of the Lord, and that's what the psalmist is saying. Show me your mercy, 
receive me that I might know your goodness. Lord, I know what it's like to be held in contempt. I know what it's like to be spoken evil of. So, Lord, I'm asking you to show mercy to me. And I ask that you would fill me with your love so that I might serve you with all of my heart. 